Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. Um, I think I'm the last talk before a break. Is that right? Yeah. Okay, so hold on for 20 more minutes, and then you can have a coffee. Um, this is where I come from. It's not springtime there, and there's no ocean, but there is a lake. That's the hospital I work at, University of Wisconsin. Um, and my aims for this talk are to review the context in which OASIS occurs, to summarize the relationship between obstetrics and bowel dysfunction, including pregnancy, vaginal birth, operative vaginal delivery, and OASIS, and review the principles of treatment of OASIS just a little bit. So we've already talked about what's defined as OASIS, but it's important to remember that OASIS is not happening in a vacuum. It's not just OASIS. It's a birth at the same time. So we're not just damaging the sphincter, we're damaging everything. The first time I saw these photos, they completely terrified me of seeing all of these muscles of the pelvic floor that we painstakingly repair in women um, and what, what happens to them during vaginal birth. So when we're talking about obstetric anal sphincter injury, we can't... Um, neglect the other parts of the pelvic floor that are also injured. Um, a lot of anal sphincter injuries happen in the context of uh, operative vaginal delivery and in the context of prolonged second stage of labor. And those things have other impacts that probably impact our continence. So trauma is not limited to the anal sphincter complex. And this picture on the left is the normal, non-pregnant female anatomy. And on the right is what's happening during the parturition process. Um, so you can see that the bladder is compressed to a tiny area at the front. Similarly, the rectum is compressed to a tiny area at the back. You see stretching of the vaginal walls and tearing of the pubocervical fascia. And then if you remove the baby from this picture, you can see how there is stretching and compression of the sacral nerves, as well as all the blood flow to the muscles, connective tissue, and nerves of the pelvic floor. So compression leads to ischemia. And we know that at 20 to 30 millimeters of mercury of pressure, microvascular flow stops. And at 80 millimeters of mercury, we have complete cessation of blood flow. And the average force during labor is 100 millimeters of mercury. So we're actually causing ischemia to the pelvic floor during the vaginal birth process. Stretching can also lead to neuropraxic injury. And we know that denervation followed by reinnervation occurs in up to 80% of women following their first vaginal birth. We know that there's impaired anorectal function after spontaneous vaginal birth, and we know that, with, that increasing parity is associated with increasing perineal descent and perineal descent with straining. We also know that Paris women have significantly reduced voluntary anal squeeze pressure compared to their nulliparous counterparts. And they also have significantly decreased anal sensation, which may have to do also with the prolonged rectoanal inhibitory reflex. So the etiology of bowel dysfunction after OASIS is really multifactorial. We're not just talking about the sphincter injury, we're talking about the vaginal delivery, which leads to potentially levator injury, pudendal nerve injury, defects in soft tissue modeling, um, and other, other risk factors like poor tissue, family history potentially, obesity, diabetes, um, that all down the road predispose us to develop pelvic floor disorders. So now I want to talk a little bit about the relationship between obstetrics and bowel dysfunction. Um, and I'm going to start by summarizing a Norwegian cohort of um, almost 1,600 primips surveyed about bowel symptoms during their last month of pregnancy. And at almost 10% had loss of formed stool at least monthly in the last month of pregnancy. And 13% had loss of loose stool at least monthly in the last month of pregnancy. 12% had loss of flatus at least weekly, and 20%, so one-fifth, had fecal urgency. A quarter of these women had at least one symptom during their last month of pregnancy, and only 5% had three or more symptoms. But the take-home message for me in this is that having anal incontinence or anal, sphincter, or, or anal symptoms during pregnancy is the strongest predictor of anal incontinence one year postpartum. So we should be paying attention at our, to our patients who are at their you know, 36, 38 week visit. We should be asking about their bowel symptoms 
to predict what what their long-term continence is going to be like. Um, this BJOG study looked at whether the mode of delivery predisposes women to anal incontinence um, and showed that the risk was highest with operative vaginal delivery and lowest with C-section. Um, but if you look carefully, um, in the first, it was really the only statistically significant relationships were when you included incontinence of flatus. So this is a busy slide, but if you notice these, you know, the diamonds are the summary of the various studies included. And on the right side here, or, is it the right side? Yes. On the right side here, um, you see the odds ratio for solid liquid and flatus incontinence. Um, and you see some diamonds here to the right side favoring cesarean section being protective. And over here, when you're just looking at actually incontinence of stool, you see the wider confidence intervals suggesting that cesarean delivery is not necessarily protective. Um, and this Cochrane review showed the same thing. You can see that all of these uh, confidence intervals are, are crossing the midline. And so you cannot say that, that cesarean delivery protects against anal incontinence. Did I go backwards? Sorry. Um, oh, yes, no, sorry. We're moving forward in time. So the data that I presented were it, from this same cohort were in the last month of pregnancy, and now we're looking at the same cohort one year later. So in the same cohort of Norwegian primips surveyed about their bowel symptoms, they were surveyed in the last month of pregnancy, and then they were followed up one year later. The um, incidence of loss of form stool at least monthly was only 5%. Loose stool at least monthly was 10%. And loss of flatus at least weekly was 6%. Fecal urgency was about the same as it was during pregnancy, 16% from 20%. Um, and at least one symptom in 19%, and three or more symptoms in 2%. Um, and having had an operative vaginal delivery um, was significantly associated with the symptom of fecal urgency specifically, suggesting that it's not necessarily the anal sphincter injury. Um, Oasis was associated with loss of flatus or stool in this one-year follow-up. This study was a nested prospective cohort, cohort of 198 nullips in a randomized trial of routine versus restricted episiotomy at the time of operative vaginal delivery. Uh, and there were potentially statistically significant uh, differences in the domains of stress urinary incontinence and anal incontinence of solids. When you look at bowel dysfunction three months after obstetric anal sphincter injury, and I'm gonna talk a lot about this study. This was a prospective cohort of 435 women who had an oasis in the UK over a five-year period. Um, and so in, the, in this sample, there were 435 women. Their mean age was 29 and a half years old. 82% were primips. 57% had a spontaneous vaginal delivery, about 34% had a forceps, and 10% had a vacuum. The anal sphincter injury classification, not surprisingly, 80% had 3A or 3B, um, and only 5% had uh, type 4. And the, most, the majority were repaired in an overlapping fashion. Uh, three months after obstetric anal sphincter injury in this cohort, there was only a 4% prevalence of fecal incontinence, but a 34% prevalence of fecal urgency. There was also a quarter of women had pain with defecation, and a quarter of women had variable or poor flatal control. Factors associated with those things, there was no difference in symptoms with an external anal sphincter injury alone versus an internal and an external anal sphincter injury. And there was no difference with the mode of repair overlapping versus end to end, which we've seen in a lot of studies. We don't think one is better than the other. Um, and poor flatal control was associated with advanced maternal age. So if you were 35 or older, or if you were older than 35, you had a much higher risk of having poor flatal control. And bowel symptoms were, in general, associated with operative vaginal delivery. So again, not just the sphincter injury, but probably actually the operative vaginal delivery and the, the anal sphincter injury in the context of the operative vaginal delivery. So patients with obstetric anal sphincter injury who have an operative vaginal delivery are the ones at highest risk for bowel dysfunction. Um, when you look at fecal urgency symptoms, 
41% of women who have a forceps delivery and 30% of women who have a spontaneous vaginal delivery or a vacuum assisted vaginal delivery have fecal urgency three months after their oasis. Incomplete bowel emptying is also experienced more commonly in women who've undergone a forceps delivery than in women who've undergone a vaginal birth, a spontaneous vaginal birth. And the highest rates of bowel symptoms are actually in women who've undergone rotational forceps, which is also not surprising if you think about what we're doing to the pelvic floor with rotational forceps. We see fecal urgency in 61% of women with rotational forceps versus 32% of all others. And we see fecal incontinence in 9% of women who've undergone rotational forceps versus 3% of all others. And this is, again, just three months after OASIS. The Booth study was a study we did in the US, um, and it, it actually was published at only as an abstract. I don't think it ever made it into, into the literature. The study was terminated early because we had such a hard time recruiting, powering the study. Um, but this was also, this was now moving on to six month follow up data after obstetric anal sphincter injury. And the correlates with anal incontinence were non white race and um, a longer duration of a second stage of labor. So a shorter duration of second stage was protective against anal incontinence. Um, in a Swedish study of 136 primips matched with two controls, cesarean and vaginal delivery, um, looking at the women with, um, with OASIS six months later, 8% had fecal incontinence, 29% had flatal incontinence, 10% had fecal urgency, and 31% had anal incontinence, meaning either the fecal or flatal. This UK study looked at women between four and 12 months after OASIS and looked at um, their, whether or not they were continent or incontinent uh, at this follow-up. I don't remember if I animated, I did, okay. Um, and you can see that 23% uh, of the women who had a third or a fourth degree laceration had incontinence at the four to 12 month period of follow-up versus much lower prevalence of incontinence in the women who had no tear first degree or second degree. And this was the only statistically significant factor in this multivariate analysis of over 1,500 women. This is data from um, Abdul and Sultan, and this is looking at, if you look at flatal incontinence or fecal urgency in women, I think this was 59 women who had undergone um, OASIS and repair. At seven weeks postpartum, the, the prevalence of flatal incontinence was 2% and fecal urgency was 10%. And then when you looked at them at one year, it was 5%, um, and which was actually better than people who hadn't undergone an obstetric anal sphincter injury. Um, but then when you followed them up at four years time and you looked at those who had an oasis versus those who didn't have an oasis, what you found was that even if they were better at one year, but when you got out to four years, they were starting to develop symptoms. And so you see the, you see, um, sorry to turn away, you see that there's a higher prevalence of anal incontinence in, there's 16% in the people who had an oasis four years after delivery versus 10% in the women who did not have an o oasis. And the same thing with flatal incontinence. I, I'm sorry, that's not statistically significant. So oasis repair and rehabilitation are really important. Um, the obstetric anal sphincter injury rate is up to one to 5% that are recognized. So not even talking about the 10 to 30% potentially that we're missing, but the ones that we recognize, we need to be doing all that we can. And um, a busy obstetrician may repair more anal, anal sphincters than a colorectal surgeon. We know that obstetric anal sphincter injury is associated with high morbidity. We, we see impact on anal pressure studies, and we, show, and we know that if people have transient anal incontinence after their first delivery, then they have a 40% risk of relapse with a subsequent delivery. Our best chance of success is with the primary repair. We see much better success rates when we fix the anal sphincter at the time of the injury than we do when we fix it you know, when somebody's 55 and she shows up in our office with symptoms, um, approximately 50% success rate at five years with a secondary repair. <laughs>
So a really important part of the process is obtaining informed consent. And you can actually, this, um, you can go to ARCOG. They've got some great resources available online um, about repair of third and fourth degree perineal tears and the things that you should tell a patient when you're, uh, when you're consenting her for the repair. Um, and you can just go and print this out. This is available free, even if you're not a member or anything like that. Um, and it talks about the serious risks and the frequent risks. And and essentially, you're, this is at the time of, an, of a vaginal delivery is the one time when you can tell her that you're probably not going to make her worse. If you're, if you're fixing her sphincter 10 years later, you can potentially make her worse. But this outlines these risks. And it, and it says t- the intended benefits are to repair damage that has already occurred. The risks quoted below might be linked to sphincter anal muscle damage rather than the repair, and these are likely to be significantly higher if the trauma is not repaired. So I think that's nice. It's nice to be able to tell women that, and it's nice to have this resource. Um, And the Royal College also has guidelines for OASIS repair. And the the basic principles are to realize that the sphincter is an important physiological structure deserving excellent surgical conditions and technique, and you should treat it like it was yours. You should do these repairs with good lighting. This should not be done in a low light setting with the patient not put in stirrups. You you should go to the operating room if you need to in order to gain adequate exposure. You should have excellent anesthesia. You need either regional or general anesthesia for an overlapping repair, and it's preferred for both. You should do the repair under aseptic conditions. You should definitely do rectal exams during the repair to make sure that you've reapproximated the defect. Um, And you should recognize and repair the internal anal sphincter defect separately if you need to. Um, And the basic principles are to identify the ends of the external sphincter. And I use Alice Alice forceps to grasp them. If there's a complete sphincter disruption, current data doesn't tell us whether we should do end-to-end or overlapping, but we don't think you should transect the external anal sphincter. If it's not a complete transection, you should not transect that muscle in order to do overlapping. You should try not to do more damage than has already been done. Um, There's not really data to support what kind of suture you should use. Um, We use long-lasting, delayed absorbable monofilament polydioxone suture, which is, we call it Maxon or PDS. Um, And I do give prophylactic antibiotics, and ARCOG says you should. ACOG, which is the American College, says that there's not enough evidence to say whether or not you should give antibiotics. But if I'm doing a sphincteroplasty for somebody in the operating room who hasn't just had a baby, I certainly prophylax them with antibiotics, so I think it makes sense to do so at the time of vaginal birth. Um, And then remember to manage their bowels, their bowels in the immediate postpartum period to prevent uh, constipation and trauma and increased likelihood of disruption of that sphincter repair. Um, Oh, this is just showing you the difference between end to end versus overlapping. I think that this audience knows that. And that's all I have. But and then we have coffee break unless people have questions for this part of the for this part of it. (laughs) Thank you.